celebrating 17 years of possibility. Pilot Flying J and Halloran Hilton Hill present Anything is Possible. Today's guest, Tyvee Small. Welcome to Anything is Possible. These are great stories about great people whose lives prove that anything is possible. Tyvee Small is my guest today. Welcome to the broadcast. Thank you for having me. You are wearing a very unique pin on the lapel of that very fine suit <laughs> next to that very fine hand-tied bow tie. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> What's that pin? Um, I forgot I had it on it. This says first gen. Um, so uh, at the University of Tennessee where I work, um, faculty and staff um, who are first-generation college students, um, we wear these pins to show our students who may be first-generation students. Um, no one in, her, in their family has ever gone to college. We wear this pin to show uh, solidar solidarity, but to also let them know that they have a resource or a mentor or someone they can talk to. Because when you go to a place, especially a place as big as UT, sometimes you get lost. And so just seeing this pin, we're hoping students can come up and say, hey, listen, I'm having some struggle here. I uh, need help with transition, whatever it may be, or just to talk. Um, so we wear these pins. So it really is a symbol of possibility. A symbol of possibility. Which means you're the first person in your family to go to college. Absolutely. Tell me about that. Um, so I grew up in a small town in South Florida called Pahokee. Um, it's, what? Wait a minute. <laughs> what is that? Pa Pahokee. Did you say Pahokee? Pahokee, yeah. What's a Pahokee? So Pahokee uh, actually is a, a native term that means grassy waters. Um, and so it's a small town in Palm Beach County. So when you think Palm Beach County, think the other side of the county. And so don't <laughs> think Mar-a-Lago and, and the beaches. Uh, it's a real, really a, a rural community. Um, right now it's about 5,000 people. Um, was born and raised there. Um, a, a large extended family. My grandparents had 10 kids. So I have 30, last count, I think I have 31 first cousins. So I uh, was born and raised in Pahokee, uh, single mom. Um, she drove school bus for 30 years, Palm Beach County Schools, and she sent my sister and I uh, both to college. So uh, we were the first ones in our family to go to college. How did it feel growing up like that? Because it feels, the experience that I've had and the experience that I've experienced from others is mm -hmm. if you grow up loved, you don't feel poor, even if you are. And we didn't feel poor. I mean, you know, because everybody around you were in the same socioeconomic uh, situation that you were in. And so I grew up with a whole lot of love. I, I, I talk about the, the women in my life growing up, and I, and I talk about my grandma who was, was loved, right? My, grandma's, my grandma, Josephine Small, who I, ra I was raised primarily with my grandma for a lot of the time. She was born in 1922, and family was everything to her. And so I, I got that from from my grandma, and then my mom uh, is you know she she had us in church every day, all day it seemed like my mom had a key to the church, so she's still Sunday school superintendent after thirty thirty two years. She is still superintendent of Sunday school, and so um, my mom really taught us the, the the love of Christ and and what that means in our family. And then I had an aunt who taught us the love of uh, education. I, my, my grandparents had 10 kids, and my aunt Janice was the only one to, uh, to go to college and get a, get a, a bachelor's degree. Um, and ironically enough, she went to Knoxville College. Really? Yes. And got her bachelor's degree. In 1982. You know, you, you know what's interesting? Um, my grandmother uh, lived and worked in West Palm Beach, Florida. Mm -hmm. um, that's where my mother and her sister and brother were raised. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a housing project, and maybe you can help me the, with this. It has a very pleasant name. It's like Pleasant, pleasant City. Pleasant City. Pleasant City. You familiar with this? Absolutely. So immediately before coming to Knoxville, I actually worked for the mayor of West Palm Beach, and Pleasant City is in the city limits, and so I did a whole lot of work in Pleasant City before coming here. So that's where my people come from. Wow. Um, my grandmother was a domestic worker, mm -hmm as were my mother and my aunt. And so to lift yourself out of mm -hmm. that environment, mm -hmm. it wasn't pleasant, right. not in terms of where we were racially and politically mm -hmm. at that time in America, right. but the people that lived there had this belief that the generations beyond them could be more than they were. Right. And so they tried to make it pleasant. 
even Mm -hmm. when it wasn't. So as you're unpacking your story, it just reminds me of of where I come from, which is why you wear that pin so that you can reference the fact that I will never forget forget. where I come from. Mm -hmm. But it also sets up the perfect contrast for where I'm going. Why don't we take a break when we come back? I got to hear the Tyvee Small story. Here's a question to ask yourself going into the break. When we make the movie about your life, who will star in that movie? (laughs) More in a moment on Anything is Possible. Possibility powered by Pilot Flying J, Covenant Health, Home Federal, and the Knoxville News Sentinel. Coming up. This is one of those things where people say, uh, and I I hope the the chancellor doesn't hear this, but um, this is one of those things where I would do it even if I didn't get paid to do it. Tyvee Small is the Interim Vice Chancellor for Diversity at the University of Tennessee. Thank you for being with us today and a candidate for Ph.D., Dr. Tyvee Small, in no short time. So thank you for being here. (laughs) The title of your movie is? Ah, I can't use anything as possible because you already have that (laughs) one. But you're talking about your Um, life is the representation of. Opportunities. Yeah. Talk about it. So my life has been opportunity. You know, I've been fortunate that people have been placed in my life to be mentors and role models and really help me get to the next level. Many times, you know, I was I was in uncharted territory, right? I grew up in a small town, but knew that education was a great equalizer. Were you a good student? You know, interesting. um, I, I was an okay student. And I was an okay student. I love learning, Hal. But in a, in a small town environment, I remember one of my teachers, Mr. Davis, saying to me, she, he said, Tyvee, sometimes you say the most brilliant thing I've ever heard followed by the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Why? It's because I was trying to balance being cool and being accepted and being a part of the, of, of the crew. And isn't so that, sometimes— Isn't that tragic that yeah. you can be penalized— for trying to be smart or for Absolutely. being smart. For being smart, right. So you have to cram yourself into a small space when you Absolutely. got big dreams. And I did that. And so um, I did that all throughout high school. It, it, as much as I love learning and I love the and I love to engage in this inquiry, um, but again, I was uh, you sometimes you're you're you, you think you're a product of your environment. Someone t- told me the other day that really you're a product of your decisions, not of your environment. Mm. Um, but I was a product of my decisions. And so when I had the opportunity to go to college, Halloran, that opened so many doors for me that I never knew were possible. I knew a little bit of it because my Aunt Janice, who who was a teacher, she retired as a teacher, she would she would she would expose me to other things in life that I didn't didn't have a chance to experience growing up. And so I knew there was a life outside of Pahokee and I wanted a part of that life. And so when I got the opportunity to go to college, I said, This is my chance to reinvent myself. And so Halloran, when I went to college, I did everything that you could imagine somebody doing in college in terms of leadership. Where'd you go to school? University of South Florida in Tampa, Florida. So went to USF. I guess at the time it was 38,000 students. Um, I I was student body president. I was homecoming king. I did college leadership Florida. That was my time to to really think about who I wanted to be and what I wanted to be in life. And so I used USF as an opportunity to reinvent myself and to do some of those things. So as you were reinventing yourself and imagining right. uh, this new you, right. what were you imagining? Who was this man that you were trying to step into becoming? Um, someone who, you know, growing up, it's, it's so a lot of the decisions I made really was a product of, of, of growing up as a, you know, with a single mom. Who was your and dad? So my dad was he, was, he was not around at the time. He was not around. And so it was my my late sister and I um, at the time. And so when I went to college and as I started I don't mean to, to stop you in the middle of this, but that was kind of fast. You said your late sister. My late sister. So you lost your sister. Car accident. 2008, um, my sister, uh, we both went to the same uh, college undergrad. So we both went to USF. We both got master's degrees from USF. She was actually finishing, working on her second master's degree in ministerial counseling. Um, uh, she was a minister. She was a woman of faith, a woman of God. Uh, and growing up as a, the younger brother, she was two years older than I, I am. So growing up, we didn't get along a whole lot because I was a, a pesky little brother. But once I uh, we went to college, we became roommates um, in college. And I realized that, you know what, she's a 
she's a really neat person, a really cool person, and we became the best of friends. And uh, we we were really really close from from college on. And then in 2008, um, she um, on the way to a cousin's funeral, her and another cousin were killed in a car accident. Died on the way to a funeral. On the way to a funeral. How'd that impact you? Deeply. Um, I it it. it I felt a level of grief and sorrow that I never knew you could feel um, because I had lost people, but I hadn't lost anybody that close to me. Someone who was a friend, a, a confidant, um, and, and so it really, it really did impact me. And, and some of the things that I do, I, I talk about my grandma and my family, but really wanted to make all of them proud. And she's one of them. And she's one of them. So, because as we're laying out kind of this timeline of your journey to becoming the, the man that you are becoming, right. this happens in the middle of that. It happens in the middle um, of that. What kind of man were you trying to become? Um, someone who was, res- first of all, someone who made who, who, who had impact. Um, because I wouldn't be where I am today if it weren't men who weren't, who some were in my family and some were people I met from church and in school who poured into me. Someone who, people who were mentors, who were role models, and I wanted to be like them. I wanted to be in a situation, wherever that was or whatever I was doing, that I had impact. An impact not only on on my life and my family, but really you talk about nations and generations, but I really wanted to have impact on other people. Um, and so I wanted to be a mentor, role model for, for young men who, who, who were like me, who were trying to figure it out themselves because they didn't have initially a man in their life to say, this is how you do this. This is how you tie a tie. This is how you, you treat people. This is how you you grow and develop as a man. And so I when I realized that I had another opportunity, I wanted to be that. And I wanted to be that for my family, but I also wanted to be that for the young men and women that I had an opportunity to come in contact with, um, particularly working in, in places like UT. You know, what's amazing is, you have this vision of wanting to have that impact, right. and you sit here today as the interim vice chancellor of diversity. Right, that's your day job. Now. That's my day job. Look at this God. is one of those things where absolutely look at God. Um, this is one of those things where people say, uh, and, I, and I hope the the chancellor doesn't hear this, but um, this is one of those things where I would do it even if I didn't get paid to do it. <laughs> right, I wake up uh, every day you know, satisfied and fulfilled that I get to do the work and work with some phenomenal young people, phenomenal young people. And I think that also talks about the work that I do in the community with the Urban League and and chairing youth and education. I get to see young people throughout our community who um, who need or want role models, who want opportunity, who want who want access. And so I get to help in some small way provide that for them. Um, every now and again, Haller and I'll get an email from a young person who I've worked with, you know, three or four years ago who said, you know, I wouldn't be here without your love, your guidance, your support, your mentorship. And that reinforces why I do what I do both in the community, but also the work that I do professionally at, at the university. Take about 60 seconds to talk to me about the power of diversity. Sometimes when the issue of diversity comes up, and I know you guys have been dealing with some complex things at the university, people recoil because they believe they're going to be force-fed acceptance Mm -hmm. of things maybe they don't want to accept. But there's so much power in Mm -hmm. diversity. Mm -hmm. Talk about the power advantage of diversity. You know, diversity at at its core is difference, but it's respecting Differences. It's, it's respecting that people have different experiences, backgrounds, perspectives, ideologies. It's about understanding that people are different from me and then and then figuring out how to respect that difference. Folks are not going to always think alike or act alike, but we are a product of our environments. And sometimes the environments that we are raised in, has, has, has it, shield us, it shields us from having the opportunity to meet and to interact with and to respect people who are different from us. Can I give an example? Sure. I teach this class called Takeoff. Um, these are, the class is just for first-generation college students. And so they, if you think about Tennessee, they come from all over the place. We were doing this assignment called um, Hopes and Fears, right? So they had to individually write down their hopes and fears about this University of Tennessee experience. And then they had to then partner with someone in the class 
and this young woman, African American young woman from inner city Memphis, and this white kid, um, white young man from rural East Tennessee, they are paired together. And all of a sudden I hear, we're twins. And I think, what on earth is going on there? So I said, Let, let's talk about this. And they went down their list, Halloran, and they had six, it was about six or seven things, and they were identical, right? It was, what did I want out? They said, we were both first generation college students. We're both in our, first in our family to do this, and so we're a little bit nervous. We both come from places where education you know, sometimes wasn't always um, uh uh, celebrated. They talked about wanting the education not only to change their lives, but to change their families' lives. And so these two people who are seemingly so different, who probably would walk by each other for four years at the University of Tennessee and not even speak to each other, um, had a chance to do this assignment to talk and realize that we have much more in common than we have that are different. And so hopefully that will spark something in each of them to not necessarily judge people by the way they look or where they're from, but to really take the time to engage and to interact and to build relationships. And that's what moves a campus forward, and that's really what moves our society forward. It looks like that's what moves you as well. Absolutely. Let's get a break. Here's your assignment. Okay. I would like for you to build a possibility person from the ground up. So when we come back, we're going to build a person. Okay. You tell me what ingredients they have to have based on your life experience okay. and the anecdotal experience you get from dealing with thousands of college students mm -hmm. trying to take off and figure out their lives as you did. Absolutely. This is Anything is Possible. More in a moment. Coming up. Actually, it goes... Live a life that your friends can defend, can defend you if they need to, but never have to. Based on your life experience and the anecdotal experience you have from working with thousands of students mm -hmm. at our state's land-grant university, university, the biggest campus, um, let's build a person, a possibility person. They need what? Faith. Yeah, they that was easy. To, I mean, you just you just jump right in. They need boom faith. Where you get that? From my mom. Growing up, um, like I said, we were at we were at ch in church every. It seems like every day, but you know, my mom was Sunday school superintendent. My mom's faith is really important to to her, um, and so we grew up in that. So we grew up um, getting really really involved in church. I mean, that was where I learned to pray, and that's where I learned to believe, and that's where I learned faith, and that's where I learned about possibilities. Um, it's, it's through those experiences. I'm um, growing up in the in the church, um, old Pentecostal church, um, and uh, and so that's, I think that's how I initially um, realized that there were possibilities. So you got to have faith. You got to have faith. What else? Got to have integrity, right? You have to be. What is a, integrity? At the very bare minimal, right? It's being a man or woman of your word, saying you're going to do something and then doing it, living a life that as much as you can, it is above reproach, right? So carrying yourself in a manner that even when your friends, you know, people talk about this and said, you know, you know, even even when you're not in the room, you, you know, your, your friends will say good things about you or, or actually it goes live a life that your friends can defend can defend you if they need to, but never have to. And well, so that, I like that. That's strong. And so living living that life. All right. So you need faith. You need integrity. integrity. What else? Hard work. Hmm. You got to you got to you, you you have to do your work. Whether you want to go to college, whether you want to get promoted, whether you want you have to do the work. Um, because if you don't do the work, you can have all of those other things. Faith that work is dead, right? So if you don't do the work, um, you will not get there as much as you want it. As much as you can visualize it, as much as you can, you dream about it. If you don't actually do the work, it's not going to happen. And so you got to have hard work, faith, integrity, hard work, and and you got to have fun. You got to enjoy what you're doing. Um, so you know, if any time I wake up and I don't have fun doing what I'm doing while I'm trying to get there, then it's not worth doing. And so you have to you have to enjoy it. You have to have fun. It has to be something that brings you joy. And if it doesn't bring you joy, why do it? Why do it? You know, as I've watched you uh, uh, grow here in Knoxville, yeah. you have exemplified all of those traits. I Thank know you. you're over at OBC and Thank you. yeah. you're the lead tambourine. And <laughs> <laughs> so I know your faith is really important to you. I, I, I know that you you truly believe 
that anything is possible. Anything is possible. Right? You, you really believe that something great could happen for you. Your work ethic is, is legendary. You're a person of integrity. But I also do sense the spirit about you. Um, there is a lightness of being that says, I'm doing what I need to do, but I'm enjoying what I need I'm to do. I'm enjoying it. Right. When you talk about anything is possible, when you talk about possibilities, growing up in Pahokee, Florida, single mom, you know, low socioeconomic background, to think that I am a, an administrator at the state of Tennessee's land grant flagship institution, that that in and of itself shows you that anything is possible um, because I couldn't. You know, growing up, I couldn't picture myself. I knew I wanted something else and something better, but I couldn't have pictured this for myself. Halloran, and it's, it's because of those things I talked about um, that I'm able to to realize this dream. And, and that's what I try to instill in, in the young people that I work with is that, you know, I, it, it doesn't happen by osmosis. If you do those things, if you operate in integrity, if you have faith, if you, you know, you do the work, um, any whatever that is that you want to realize in your life, you can do it. And wow. so I, I, I hope my life is a living example of really what just what, just what you said, which is anything is possible. Well, I, I'm thankful that you're here in Knoxville, and I'm thankful that the students on this campus and in this community can right. can uh, kind of watch you and, and absorb that. And thank you for being here today. Thank you.